Awesome this morning. You know, whenever you have the campus take charge of a service, everything is fast, you know? A little out of breath after that one, you know? Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you so much for your love. God, thank you so much that you've given us this new life, that you've given us health, that you've given us an amazing earth to live on. God, we don't deserve anything good, but we're so grateful that you looked down, you stooped, you stooped down to make us great. God, we're so grateful for the forgiveness of sins that you sent your amazing son to come and die on the cross for us wicked people. God, we know that even when we were sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. God, I pray that this lesson really convicts our hearts, that this, re this lesson inspires us even, Father, to draw closer and closer to you every single day. God, I pray that you push me aside and that you speak to your people this morning. God, we dedicate this sermon, this service to you. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, you know, I, I would be remiss if I, I didn't honor a dear brother of ours. Uh, we didn't get a chance to announce it. But I definitely wanted to announce uh, this Sunday, sadly, uh, is Dejan's last Sunday with us. Um, and our brother, our brother's going to go back to Chicago. He has a son there. He's going to go and take care of his family. Bro, we honor you in the Lord. Thank you for coming to L.A. to help build this ministry. I love you, bro. Title of the lesson this morning, Do You See What God Sees? Do you see what God sees? You know, God is amazing. Uh, it would be amazing to be God one day, wouldn't it? We get movies like, some of you guys are like, no. Uh, we get movies like Bruce Almighty, right? And we, we, he has all these powers, and uh, it, the first night he's like messed up because he hears everyone's prayers. He's like, everyone just stop talking to me, right? He's walking on water. I love that scene. But what's, what's cool is to think that because God is elevated and because God is outside time and outside our realm, God sees everything. See, God looks down and he sees the Southland region in the City of Angels International Christian Church. God looks down and he sees the House of Heroes House Church. He looks down and he sees even the Incredibles House Church. Yeah. I know, you're shocked. He sees you too, right? God looks down, he sees the Wow House Church. God sees, he looks down and he sees that there is hope for the world. That this world, as wicked as it is, it has a chance. Because God sees you. God looks down and he's fired up about his disciples. This morning, I want to encourage you, but I also want to call you to a standard. That if God sees what he sees, we have to see what God sees this morning. I got three points for us this morning. Point number one, the world is a dark place. Wow. Point number two, the fully committed superheroes. It's a campus service. I got to talk about heroes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Point number three, a chance for the world. Turn your Bibles to Luke 19. You know, here in, in Luke chapter 19, we see that Jesus enters Jerusalem and the people are hailing him as king. They got their cloaks on the floor, they got leaves in the air, and they're singing songs. And the Pharisees, the religious people, it's always the religious people that like kind of mess things up, right? They go to Jesus and they, you need to rebuke your disciples. What are they doing? They're too fired up. Those campus students, those teen students are too fired up. Rebuke those guys. And here's Jesus' response in verse 41. Verse 41, chapter 19 of Luke. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. 
They would dash you to the ground, you and your children, within your walls. They would not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming. What incredible passage. Jesus here is really predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. We know that the first destruction of the temple was way back in Nebuchadnezzar's day when King Nebuchadnezzar historically destroyed the temple built by Solomon, roughly 586 B.C. Here, Jesus started his ministry roughly around 2930 A.D. And now he's predicting that Jerusalem, especially the temple, will be destroyed. Well, how do we know that? The scriptures teach here that a time is coming when your enemies will build an embankment around you. And then he says in the later part of verse 44 that no stone will be left on another. See, they built the temple with stones. And now he's saying when the, when the temple is going to be destroyed, no stone will be left on another. It will be completely destroyed by your enemies. See... We know that Titus, historically, was the one who destroyed the temple in roughly 70 AD. If those dates pan out right, I know I'm throwing a lot of dates at you, that means that Jesus predicted something that would happen 40 years before it even happened. That this destruction will happen. Well, we know that the Jews had zealots. What's a zealot? Uh, a zealot was a, a, a Jew who was really revolting against the Roman Empire as much as they could. We know that Jesus himself, one of the apostles, was a zealot. Well, in Judah, the procreator of Judah at the time was Gessius Florus. And at one point, he's recorded of massacring 3,600 Jews. You can understand the Jews were not very happy about that. So they revolted. They started to fight back. A revolution started in the, Jew -ish, the Jewish community. Well, we know they actually won some battles. The Jews won some battles. And Emperor Nero at the time was like, this cannot be. Let's send my best general out there to destroy these Jews. Well, who was the general that he sent? Vespasian. If you study out in history, Vespasian eventually becomes emperor after Nero. Now, why is Nero important? See, Nero was the most vicious persecutor of the first century Christians. We know that he's recorded as lighting disciples as his evening light in his backyard. He would literally at night, for fun, because he thought it was fun, he would take a disciple of Jesus Christ and light him on fire, and that would be what lit up his backyard. That's the emperor of Rome at one time. Well, he dies. And who takes his place? His highest general, Vespasian, takes his place. Well, there's still this Jewish issue that's going on in Jerusalem. What do we do with that? Well, the first thing he did as emperor was he put his son Titus in charge to take over this Jewish war. Well, we know that uh, Titus eventually takes the city of Jerusalem. He goes and he's very successful. <clears throat> now, it, in history... We know that uh, the walls were broken down, but at the time, the Romans, interestingly enough, became really good at war, which is why they were very powerful. They had new war machines that hurled big boulders to knock down walls. We see them in movies, right? Lord of the Rings. You take this big old machine, you put a big old rock on it, and like a slingshot, they sling it, and that's what breaks down the wall. And that's how they get into the city. Well, the Romans did that, and they were very effective, just like crucifixion. They took this thing, and they became experts at breaking walls down. Well, here, we know that they eventually get to the first wall, break it down. Then they get to the second wall, break that down. And finally, they get to the third and final wall before the temple, they break the wall down. Well, where do the Jews go now? Their last line of defense is the temple. So they run into the temple for rescue, and they stay in there for another three-something years. Isn't that pretty incredible? Yeah. Well, over time, the embankment that Jesus was talking about was outside their doors. 
And now they're throwing these big boulders and knocking the wall little by little. The Jews were fighting in the day and they were trying to build the wall at night. Their walls are coming cr crumbling down. See, what, what I think is amazing is Jesus in verse 41, the Bible says he looked over Jerusalem and he wept. Yeah. If you look at the Greek, the word wept in Greek translates to tears of agony. Wow. See, I believe that Jesus looked at the city and where they were spiritually was devastating. Right. Yet he didn't just see where they were currently. Jesus saw the actual destruction of the temple. And Jesus wept tears of agony for his people. You know, I remember the, the last time I wept in prayer, in tears of agony for the lost. See, we look at the world that we live in, and it's so dark. We look at TV, you, you put on news for a little bit, you get depressed. You get more and more news of more and more destruction. The divorce rate has gone up from 75% to 80%, I believe. Wow. That's in California alone. You think with all the education we have, with the technology that we've come so far with, that we would figure out how to live life. And if you look behind closed doors, we have not figured out how to live life. Wow. Marriages are being destroyed. Yeah. Families are being destroyed. Little kids are being molested and raped, trafficking, drugs. You saw the, the, the picture of the two parents who were, who were overdosed on drugs in the passenger seat while their four-year-old kid is sitting in the back seat. Do you think we figured out how to live life? No, we have not. We have UCLA here. We have our Harvards. We have uh, people who build amazing phones like like a, a laptop in this thing. And yet we have not figured out how to have relationships and how to keep relationships. But I remember the day like it was yesterday. I was a young Christian and I started for the first time after 20 years going to church, I realized that I was not saved. I realized that what my church taught and what I, I tried to follow was not even in the Bible. And it destroyed my entire universe. You know, at one point I was very committed. You know, like I was one of those excited guys who, who would be excited at church and then, then outside of church, not so much. But God gave me the opportunity to come out of that dark world. And I got baptized. It was awesome. But it's not enough to just be saved yourself. You want to save others. You want to save your family. So I was, uh, I was I'm a young guy. I, I moved into the brother's household uh, because I, I lived as a disciple um, with my parents for the first four months, and it was not good. You know, when you're not surrounded with disciples every day, you fall into sin. Yeah. And, and I, had, I had the challenge, uh, you know, my, my, my mentor at the time, my disciple sat me down. He's like, hey, you need to move in with the brothers. Well, I ain't got a job. Well, you move in and you find a job. So that's what we did. That was the plan. If you don't have a job, your job is to find a job. So I did. I started looking for work, and, and I found this amazing job uh, working at Big Lots. Guys, it's tough. It was tough. It's tough. Well, what's exciting is, is Big Lots was not too far from my household, so it was awesome. That, yeah, let me get a bike. So brother gives me a bike, and I'm riding to work. Someone steals my bike in Orange County. I can understand if I was in Southland, but like I'm in Orange County. <laughs> so they steal my bike. Now I gotta walk to work. You, you gotta pay the rent. You can't just not show up to work because someone stole your bike. You gotta pick yourself up and you go to work. So, so let's just say I had a 48 minute prayer walk to work. I timed it, I timed it, it was 48, on a dot. So I'm walking to work one early morning, and I started to pray about the world. I started to pray about the darkness that I saw in the world, and why I was so fed up in churches that even there's darkness in the churches. Then I started to think about my brother. See, in October, it's, it's going to be a couple years now, in October 18th, 
2008, I lost my brother to a malignant brain tumor. For my family, see, in the Samoan culture, uh, especially for my family at least, I grew up going to weddings and funerals all the time. And this was the first time where we had a funeral that was close to my heart. My oldest brother passed away at the age of 20. And when I was praying about it, yeah, he was really young. And at the time, it really destroyed my family. It, it was devastating for us. I'll never forget the call at 2.15 a.m. in the morning that my brother passed away. And uh, driving over to my parents' place, and uh, the first person I saw was my youngest brother in tears. Hard time. But I was praying about my brother and how he has not heard the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And how the Bible teaches this very, very, very hard line that if you don't have the gospel, if you don't repent of your sins, make Jesus Lord of your life and are baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, hell is awaiting you. Thinking about my brother not being there in heaven if I make it, because I can, I can totally not make heaven. All of us can fall away tomorrow. I was thinking about it and it brought me to tears. I wept on my way to work. To think that if I die, a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, I'm not going to be welcomed by my brother in heaven. And it made me weep. Like Jesus looked over Jerusalem, he shed tears of agony. Of the destruction of his own people. I looked and I was brought to tears about my brother. How many more brothers are there? Are we going to allow to die before we step up and do something about it? I believe that as Christians, we got to imitate Jesus. Jesus was a man who cried. Real men cry. I know the world tells you that it's not cool to cry. I, I cry all the time. And crying is good. But are you weeping for your city? When's the last time you, you were at your workplace and you wept tears of agony for your workmates? On campus, seeing the thousands of students walk aimlessly through life because they don't have the gospel of Jesus Christ. The challenge is very simple. We got to get to work. Amen. Amen. This world that we live in is a dark place and it's not getting any lighter. It's getting darker and it's getting darker. And it's up to us to weep the tears of agony to see this world one for the Lord. Amen. Amen. This week, I want to challenge you. Come on, bro. Get to some tears. Yes. See, many of us have not cried in a long time. And it really hardens our heart to really see what God sees. God sees a wicked world. And he sees a hurting world. But do we see what God sees? I want to challenge you this week. Get broken in tears for the dark world that we live in. Go out, pray. Have the best prayer life you've ever had this month. Have the best times. Get, get some friends in your schedule. Hey, Ricky, can we pray together this week? Hey, Matt, can we pray? Can you teach me how you pray? Matthew Lovachet, bro, you're Mr. Incredible. Teach me how to pray like you pray. <laughs> Let's weep for the lost world, amen? Yeah. Point number two, the fully committed superheroes. Go to 2 Chronicles 16. See, I believe as disciples, I believe as Christians, we are superheroes. Now, Satan can get in there, and Satan has done a great job this week with some of us in helping us to believe that, no, we are not superheroes. I want to encourage you and inspire you this morning that you are superheroes. But what kind of superheroes should we be? 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Well, some might say, well, yeah, I want to be strengthened. I'm committed. And the religious world teach you that there's different commitment levels. The pastors have one commitment level. The interns have another. And then the regular churchgoers have this kind of commitment level. 
I put before you that that is a false teaching. The Bible says that God wants to strengthen you. I don't know about you, I need some strengthening. Uh, we like to act tough, but we are weak. We're, I mean, Jesus, he, he compared us to some sheep, right? Sheep, sheep is like the dumbest animal. Really. I'm not kidding. You study out sheep. They see one sheep jump off the cliff. Guess what they're doing? They're jumping. Hey, let's join the party. But the Bible says God is looking for those who are committed. No. God is looking to strengthen those who are fully committed to him. Imagine if Superman wasn't fully committed. How would that story pan out? If Superman wasn't fully committed, Lois Lane would have died 30 minutes within the story. No more. No more girl. No more. No more saving people. Right? Yeah, Batman. Right? What if Batman wasn't fully committed? Someone killed his dad. Let's just, let's just mope for the rest of our lives. Right? Let me just mope. And let me hide, let me find a bat cave and curdle up. And let me just, let me just mope for the rest of my life. No, these guys were fully committed to saving the world. See, that represents us. If we are fully committed, the Bible says he will strengthen you. Stronger than Superman. Stronger than any other superhero we see in the comics. Jesus will strengthen him, you himself. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Even Mr. Incredible, you know, like, we got to talk about the Incredibles. See, Mr. Incredible was not fully committed at one time. He lost the dream. And then what happened to his life? He was out of shape, unsatisfied with his life, and he started to live a double life. Does that describe us when we're not fully committed? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting the people's sin against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, as disciple superheroes, we don't have an S on our chest. Uh, some of us might think we have our, our, a picture of ourselves. We like selfies, right? On our chest. No, sorry, you don't represent yourself anymore. And this is not no S on my chest. We represent Christ. What's an ambassador? An, an ambassador in the government is like one of the uh, prestigious um, jobs you can have. They represent the United States of America. Do you think people around the world where we have ambassadors want to mess with these guys? Absolutely not. Because even in my culture, you mess with one, you mess with the whole family. Ambassadors are the same. They represent the United States. You mess with them, you got to mess with the United States of America. You mess with one disciple of Jesus Christ, you're dealing with the kingdom of God. First Corinthians chapter 12. I want to encourage you, you are superheroes. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. But if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? 
if the whole body were an ear, what the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it, as it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are part of the body, the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. What an incredible passage to teach us what we are here this morning. Though we are many parts, we form one body. See, in Southland, we have a lot of parts, and we need a lot of parts. See, this scripture, I believe, was where they got the idea for uh, the Avengers. <laughs> they did. They read, someone read the Bible and was like, hey, let's, 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 let's create the Avengers. You have different parts. You have the Hulk, Iron Man. You have all these guys with different talents who coming together make this incredible group of heroes. That sounds like Southland to me. That in Southland, though we are one body, we have many parts. Yeah. See, if everyone was the preacher, there would be no one in the audience. And then we'd be self-righteous guys trying to be right. If everyone was the usher, then no one would preach. We would usher people here and there would be no one at the pulpit. That's kind of weird. Right? Like, don't... Isn't it awesome that we have communion every Sunday? Yeah. Our sister Julie does an amazing job at making these awesome communion. Just because you're not a preacher does not mean you, you are less important. See, Satan gets in there and makes you think that you're not important. That if you were to fall away, no one would care. Let me tell you, that is a false doctrine sent from Satan himself. You are an important part of the body of Christ. See, some of you guys are the pinky. A pinky is important, right? Some of you guys are the pinky toe. Try to balance yourself without the pinky toe. Have you ever tried to open a bottle of, of water without your thumb? Every aspect of the body is super important. You represent every single body, every single part to the body of Christ. As superheroes, this is where we get our strength with the family, with the body. You cut yourself off from the body, what happens? You eventually die. And so I want to encourage us that where we get our strength is in numbers. Meetings, the meetings of the body. We seek first the meetings of the body because we understand the importance of the whole body. Go to Acts chapter 19. See, when you understand you're a superhero and that you are called to be fully committed, that you understand that it's not the S on your chest, but that we represent Christ, and that we are part of the body of Christ, it compels us to do amazing, crazy things. That's what the campus ministry is all about, being crazy and doing amazing things. And the teens, and the teens. In Acts 19, verse 9, here they're preaching in Ephesus. The Bible says, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. What an incredible passage that these guys went to a city that eventually refused them and even started to publicly oppose them. So what do they do? 
go find the bat cave and mope? No, they preach the word of God. Here, we see that the Bible says for two years, they had daily discussions. After two years, this whole province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Well, did everyone become disciples? Of course not. But everyone had an opportunity to come into God's wonderful light. I want to read you a story that I heard at the GLC. I had to share it. I had to steal it. I stole it. When I was a young man, I wanted to change the world. I found it was difficult to change the world. So I tried to change my nation. When I found I couldn't change the nation, I began to focus on my town. I couldn't change the town, and as an older man, I tried to change my family. Now as an old man, I realize the only thing I can change is myself. And suddenly I realized that if long ago I had changed myself, I could have made an impact on my family. My family and I could have made an impact on our town. Their impact could have changed the nation and I could indeed change the world. You are superheroes, whether you believe it or not. This, this man realized over years that we learned very quickly because we just read the Bible, that we are not going to impact the world by, by focusing on the masses. See, the religious world wants to focus on the masses. They want the mega churches. But the commitment level in the church is up and down and up and down. See, we don't believe that that's true. Biblically, we start with us. If we could change us, we could change our families. With the help of our family, we can change our town. With the help of the whole town, we change the nation, the nation to the world. I want to lift up a young man here this morning. We have uh, Mr. Teal Jackson Tarver getting baptized. Teal is going to get baptized this morning. And what an incredible story. Uh, Keontae Davis reached out to Teal a while back. They had been studying here and there and here and there. But they eventually, during the summer, they started to actively study the Bible together. And so I, I get these texts. We, we taught Aleem and Keontae are praising this guy. Like, man, this guy's awesome. You got to meet him. It's like, yeah, let's go meet this guy. So we go and we do a, a Bible study about what does it mean to be a Christian in the Bible. And we just laid out all of Jesus' definition of what it means to be a true Christian. And not what they're teaching in the religious world today. What, what's in the Bible? And after the Bible study... It was a simple question. Teal, do you want to be a disciple? No. Well, there's not much more to say here. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, have a good time. Let's pray. There's not much you can say after someone says, oh, I don't want to do that. And we go and I'm talking to Keontae and Keontae is like, Mace, this guy's awesome. I'm going to keep in there. I was like, Keontae, make me a believer. Make me a believer. Keontae got in there, Rico got in there, all the brothers at Elko got in there, they studied the Bible, and he is now going to be your brother in the Lord this morning. I stand as a believer, I stand as a believer that Keontae is a fully committed superhero. I stand a believer that it doesn't matter what people say to us, what they do to us, if we just get them into the Bible, it will change them. Yeah. What is the challenge? In the, Asia, in the province of Asia, they evangelized that whole area in two years. What does that mean to us in Southland? See, in Southland, we're not just... See, some of you guys get faked out, and some of us need, to, we need some help with some vision. See, we're not just trying to evangelize little El Camino. We're not just trying to evangelize little Compton. We're not just trying to evangelize our little Bible talks. We, are, we, are, we have the role in Southland of overseeing 8 million souls in Southland. 
eight million. What has God done in Southland the past couple of years? It took nine superheroes on, in Southland, on, and they built it up to 140 some odd disciples. That's awesome. I put before you, family, if we are fully committed superheroes, we can evangelize Southland in two years. We could do it. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? I believe if, I believe if we, we imitate our dear brother Keontae, we can see many, many come to the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and be baptized into our family. My challenge is very simple. It's time to be outwardly focused. See, a lot of what we've done up until this point have been a lot of inward focused things, right? Like, so life talks, switching up Bible talks, switching up like uh, disciples and all that good stuff, right? We're trying to make sure that we take care of the flock. Then we have a big GLC. That's inward stuff. That's making you get fired up for the year, right? So we've done all these inward things. Now it's time to focus outwardly. We got to go and start sharing our faith like mad men and women that we are. Our D times. Take your D times out of your apartment. Go to Starbucks and have your D times. Uh, take your D times and go and have sharing times. Go and share your faith with the person you're mentoring. Go get into a Bible study. It's time for us to go and evangelize all of Southland. Amen. In the staff... In staff, we call it Super September. And, and Tim has called all the leaders to have the best September they've ever had in their entire life. I want to challenge you with the same thing because we don't have different commitment levels. I want to challenge every single one of you, a part of this church, to be fully committed in Super September 2016. Amen? <laughs> Lastly, point number three, a chance for the world. Go to Colossians chapter 1. If you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ, you are the chance that the world needs to see the light. And in Colossians chapter 1, this is an amazing passage, right? Here in verse 23, the Bible says, and this is Paul writing to the disciples in Colossus. If you continue in your faith, verse 23, chapter 1. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm. And do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And of which I, Paul, have become a servant. It's amazing. In the first century, before they all saw death, the first century brothers and sisters evangelized the whole known world. Well, how did they do that? They didn't have airplanes. How'd they go to the other part of the world to evangelize? They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. How did they go with that very limited resources and, and shed the gospel to the whole known world? They saw what God saw. They saw a hurting world. They realized from the scriptures and from what Jesus taught that they had to be fully committed superheroes and that they were the chance for the world if you're sitting in this room here today you have a chance see many of you guys came to visit us today and we welcome you with open arms if you haven't we like we like to say we have a, a saying in our church it's called love bombing and if you felt a little awkward getting a hug that's what love bombing is welcome to our family but many of you guys had came and visited and thought this was just you being nice to your friend and saying, hey, I'll come out to church. No. Uh, some of you guys came because you, you, uh, you felt bad that you've been ignoring this phone call like all the time, right? And you're, yeah. Man, I'm going to just get this guy off my back. Let me go to this church service. <laughs> what you don't understand from the scriptures is that you are here because God determined that you would be here this morning. And you have a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, if you're, if you're visiting, study the Bible. The world is so jacked up, and even the Christian world is jacked up. It's not about who's right. 
is the Catholics right or the Mormons right? It's about what's right. If I can get people, if I can get people to what's right, which are the scriptures, they themselves will know who is right. That's what blew my mind that I was so fed up with false religion. I was 20 years old and I was fed up with the fake Christians I saw in church. And so I left. I got to college. I started doing the college life, partying, messing around, doing all these things. Once I found some true superheroes, they got me to their source, the Bible. Once I studied the Bible, I was like, of course there's hypocrisy in my church. No one is living the Bible. One plus one equals two. It just makes sense. You have a chance to hear the true gospel of Jesus Christ. See, we don't claim to be a perfect church, but we, we claim to know the Bible and we are living the Bible. And we call every single member to the same standard, whether you're a janitor or a preacher in our church. You know, I think about the day, you ever think about this? I think about the meeting where we announce that we've evangelized the whole world. Like what, like what year will that be? I don't know. But I want to be there. It's going to be at a, it's most likely will be at a GLC. Right? And, and who knows? Who's going to, I don't know who's going to announce it. I would love to announce it, but I don't know. Right? Someone's going to get up there. And, and after years of, of sacrificing financially, sending our best people out to plant churches, all these things, someone gets up and says, this is the gospel that you have heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And everyone goes crazy. My question is, where will you be? Where, where are you going to be? See, I, I imagine I'm sitting next to my wife. And, and we're a little older. But not that much older, hopefully. And, and we, have, we have some kids. Maybe not too many, because I can't afford it. But we're going to have some kids. I have a daughter already, so I'm on my way. And I'm there with my family. And behind us is the church that God has given us to lead. Maybe somewhere in Indonesia. Maybe somewhere in the islands. You know, I'm Islander. We don't know. But behind us is going to be superheroes that came with us to the GLC. It's going to be awesome. But look, it's Dylan with his church. Yes. I, I can't believe that sister said yes to him. <laughs> but Dylan's going to have his own church. And I look over yonder, like, no way. That's, that's Jermaine's church. <laughs> like, no way. We're going to see Jimmy and his uh, Latino United group over there. We're going to see the halls, and they're going to be incredible. We're going to see the Andersons leading the whole entire CR for the whole movement. Where will you be? I want to be there. I'm, I'm going to fight tooth and nails to be there at that meeting. And I pray that when that day comes, that we are a lot more like Jesus than we are right now. Amen? How do we do this? How do we evangelize 8 million souls in Southland? How, how do we evangelize the 8 billion people in the world? I believe it's very, very simple. My challenge is that we need to start going after missions. See, if you're visiting with us today, we believe in Jesus' dream. We're not just playing church here. Uh, we don't just wear good ties on a Sunday to wear good ties. We're, we're here to see Jesus' dream accomplished here on earth. And if the first century disciples did it without Twitter, we believe we could do it in the 21st century, amen? <clears throat> with, that, with that comes a lot of sacrifices. 
We've already sacrificed relationships. We sent some of our best friends from Southland to Chicago. And that's still hurting a bit for some of us. We're, we're sending Jay John back to our, our church in Chicago. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice financially. We've already been toiling to make sure that we take care of our brothers and sisters in the third world. Churches in Haiti, that they don't have much of anything. Churches in Africa, where, where we hear stories of disciples carrying their, their chair two and a half hour walk to church. See, we have a lot more than you think. And if we are to see every creature under heaven hear the gospel, we're going to need to go after tagging. We're going to need to go after sacrificing financially to see this world one for the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage us. This week, Bible talk leaders, we need to go back out. I know in some ways we've, been, we've shifted and tried to evangelize and, and focus there. We also got to see we're, we're not just a family. We're, we're an army. So we're a family army, if that makes sense. And so we can't, we can't neglect one battle for another battle. Let's get back out there. Let's go tagging. Let's go do everything we can to see this world evangelize in our day. Amen? Amen. This morning, do you see what God sees? I want to encourage you that the world that we live in is a dark place. And it's going to take fully committed superheroes like yourselves to win the world for God. And to understand that this morning, you are the chance for the world. You are the chance for your town. You are the chance for the nation. And you are the chance to see this world won for our Lord. I love you very much. To God be all the glory.